All right, so 22? Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, so we should start by making a graph. So it looks like this is the area we're focusing on. The area between y is 0, x is 1, x is 3, and our curve. So the, so the first thing you have to do here is you have to sketch the graph. You have to start by actually sketching the graph. They should give you functions that are pretty easy to sketch out if you think about it a little bit. So when x goes to 0 here, the function goes to infinity. And when x goes to infinity, the function goes to 0. So that gives us this general form. It's easy to plug in x equals 1. If you plug in x equals 1, you get 1. And if you plug x equals 3, you get 1 third. So we can get the general. The, the shape doesn't have to be exactly right, but you have to get the general shape of the curve. Then you have to figure out what is the area you're focusing on. Well, here's the area that we're looking at. And we're going to be rotating this around the x-axis. And can you see that this is the general shape that we're going to get if we rotate this around the x-axis? Um, so if we rotate this around the x-axis, so this curve here is giving us this top cont contour. And when it rotates down below, it's going to give us this bottom contour, like this. And in the middle, the shape is going to look like this. Okay? And it's solid because it hits, um, it hits uh, the x-axis. That's right. This is going to be a solid and not a hollow um, structure, like you said, because the area we're rotating extends all the way to the axis we're rotating around. So there's not going to be any empty space inside. That's a good point. All right, now we have two different methods for figuring out areas. Our general method here is to take rectangular strips. Rectangular strips. Well, we can take a rectangular strip that's parallel to the axis we're rotating around, or we can take a rectangular strip that is perpendicular to the axis that we're rotating around. So we could take a rectangular strip that looks like this, or we could take a rectangular strip that looks like this. This one is parallel to the axis we're rotating around, and this one is perpendicular to the one that we're rotating around. The method of cylindrical shells would use strips that are parallel to your axis. So if they had told us to use the cylindrical shells method, we would have to use rectangular strips that look like this, because this strip is parallel to the axis that we're rotating around. Um, and the other method doesn't really have a name. Um, so they didn't give us any name here, so we know we're supposed to use the other method. They, you might call it the disk or the washer method. Oh, yeah. So the other method, if there's no name, so sometimes it's just a no-name method, but it, it could also be called the disk with the C, disk or um, the washer method. Uh, and that's when the strips are perpendicular to the axis that you're rotating around. Well, here they did not give us a name. So that was a clue that we're not using cylindrical shells. We're using the no-name disc or washer method, which means we want to use strips that are perpendicular to the axis we're rotating around, which means that we want to use strips that look like this. So these will be the strips <coughs> that we use. So not these strips. So we would just set up an integral then from, I'm thinking, from 1 to 3. That's right. So 
our x variable is going from 1 to 3. That's right. Now when we rotate these strips around, they're going to give us cylindrical disks. Right. So it would be 1 over x. But say it were, um, say it was asking instead of um, y is equal to 0. Right. Well, let's back up for a second and make sure we got this right. Um, so what should I put in the integral here? 1 over x. So let's think about that a little bit more. What we need to do here is we need to find the area of this little cylinder. Mm -hmm. Well, what's the area of a cylinder? Oh. Or the, the area of this little cylindrical disk? Well, the area of this cylindrical disk is going to be the area of the face, which is pi r squared, times the height of the disk. That's how you find the area of a cylinder, of the volume of a cylinder, area times the height. Well, the radius here is given by the function. The function is going to tell us the radius. So that would be pi times y squared. And what's the height? The height is dx. dx is the height of this little cylinder that we're working with here. So what we actually put in here is pi times y squared times dx. So we don't put in y, we put in y squared, and we got to put the pi in as well. So y is the radius? That's right. Can you see that here? This distance here oh, yeah. is the radius, and that's given by y. And the thickness of this little cylindrical disk is given by our differential dx, because that's how wide this part of the partition is. I didn't give myself enough space, but this becomes. And what should I plug in for y? Well, y here is 1 over x. Mm -hmm. Wait, wait, um, h is dx because it's the difference. Well, h is the height of the cylinder. Um, what we're thinking about doing here is we're making a bunch of cylindrical disks. Each of them is going to have a width of dx. Wait, why do they have a width of dx? Dx is the change in x. That's right. We're going, we're moving x from 1 to 3. So what we're thinking of doing is splitting the x-axis up into um, a bunch of partitions of width dx. And each of those is going to represent one thin cylindrical disk. partitioning the x-axis into um, a bunch of little intervals so that we can make a bunch of little rectangular strips. And the width of each rectangular strip is going to be dx. dx stands for the size of our intervals. Uh, and then the radii of each of these is going to be however, whatever the function value is here. So that gives us pi times the radius squared times dx. So this would be So we have to take this integral. So what does this uh, integral come out to be? So the antiderivative here has a negative sign in it, because we have to divide by negative 1.
Yeah. And that's the answer? That's the answer. That's right. So this term here is the volume of one cylindrical disk. And then if we add up all the cylindrical disks and take the limit, as the partitions get smaller and smaller, that's going to give us the total volume. 